My name is David Merrick. I'm the director here at the Center for Disaster Risk Policy at Florida State University. Uh, my name is Justin Adams. I'm the president of CRASAR, which is a center for robot assisted search and rescue. It's a joint partnership between Texas A&M and uh, Florida State University. The Center for Disaster Risk Policy's primary mission uh, is to create and promote best practices in emergency management, including the use of unmanned aircraft systems in disasters. CRASAR, the Center for Robot Assisted Search and Rescue's main focus is looking at unmanned systems and how they can assist in disasters or everyday events. So that would be aerial platforms, that will be ground-based platforms, and that will be water-based platforms. And then we want to educate the community and public safety responders to be able to, at the end of the day, reduce risk by not putting people in manned aircraft or manned boats or whatever that those events may be and putting an unmanned platform in it. So CRASAR started in 2001 after September 11th. Uh, Dr. Robin Murphy, which is our vice president and co-founder of uh, CRASAR, started the program and their initial tasking was using robots in the World Trade Center, such as the snake robots, to go into the rubble to actually look for victims of September 11th. It evolved over the years, and in 2005 was the first time that UAS was actually used on a disaster response in the United States. It was a larger RC platform with a camera on it, but it was the first time damage assessment was done. Also during that event was the first time that a sonar uh, vessel unmanned system was actually doing underwater surveys in and around New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. So that was the first two instances of it evolving. Uh, over the years it's evolved. We've uh, been part of the Fukushima tsunami and post-nuclear event. At different events around the world, we've uh, supported the uh, migrant population from Syria and Northern Africa, uh, being able to use uh, different uh, man or unmanned platforms on the water to go out and assist any victims that may be in the water. So we've done a lot of different things and then more involved in uh, 2014, 2015, we started getting more into the UAS and looking at from an artificial intelligence machine learning component, how can we take the drone or the UAS into a different area and actually look at the machine learning and learning and using neural networks and learning more and more about uh, the data set that's coming out of it. We've been using drones uh, in disasters since 2012. Um, and we really got our start in mapping and modeling hazards, uh, particularly in communities that couldn't afford to do that in any other way. And we, we kind of identified that, that UAS or drones were a um, low cost way to kind of recreate uh, some of these tools regarding hazard modeling, particularly storm surge and uh, hazardous materials and all this type of things. We could, we could replicate some of that more expensive work in a, in a very affordable way. So that's how we, we really kind of, that was the idea that started all of this. Uh, from the response side, we've got Hurricane um, Matthew in 2016, uh, Hurricane Harvey and Irma in 2017, um, Michael in 2018, as well as the Lower Puna volcanic event in Hawaii uh, in 2018, uh, as well as numerous uh, missing persons cases and, and kind of smaller uh, search events uh, throughout Florida and, and Texas. Everything you should be doing with a drone in emergency management or in emergency services is to compress a timeline, to speed something up, right? And that could be the speed, speed up information gathering, to speed up a search, right? To make existing resources and teams on the ground more efficient and more able to do their job. Um, and that should be the goal. And if you're, if you're flying and you're finding you're not doing that, then maybe that's not the scenario you should be working in. But, but missing persons is a great example. Um, and we've just done four missing person cases in the past two months. Uh, typically, this is going to be elderly people with Alzheimer's or dementia that have walked away from their house. And they get confused once they walk away. They don't know how to get back. Uh, in here in North Florida, there's a lot of rural areas where if you walk away from your house, you find yourselves in the woods very, very quickly. Uh, and like right now outside, it's, uh, it's the temperatures in the 30s. Uh, if, it, uh, if, if an 80-year-old man walks away from his house tonight, 
and can't find his way home, he's in a very dangerous position. He can he could die of exposure by, by dawn. Um, and so in that type of situation, being able to speed up that search uh, and in using uh, a thermal imaging like the Anafi Thermal uh, is, is going to make a huge difference in how fast we can clear areas to make sure that person isn't there. Oftentimes with the drone, it's not about finding the person, it's about eliminating areas, right? They're not in this field, they're not in this river, they're not on this pond, they're not on the, uh, on the water line of this pond. Um, and we can clear that very quickly with a thermal camera. Uh, and then the ground resources can then be used elsewhere. So altogether, when you put everything together, you're able to cover more ground faster and hopefully get that person, uh, that missing person back to a place of safety before the weather you know, overcomes them. We've been partnered with uh, with the urban search and rescue teams here in Florida going back to 2016, Hurricane Matthew. So we've, but it's taken that long for it to become kind of natural, right? So at least three hurricane seasons, we've been talking about this, uh, you know, the use of drones. And now uh, in the 2019 season, we're, we're seeing that good integration between uh, the UAS teams and that capability and the fire departments. Um, there's also a lot of interest uh, in Florida with the uh, with law enforcement, particularly um, the uh, tactical teams, search and rescue, uh, narcotics teams, things like that, uh, making the use of drones for a variety of things. And again, the, the goal there is to be able to do some of this work without putting on an officer at risk, uh, right? Put the drone uh, closer to a suspect rather than uh, than an officer, right? So um, that's kind of one of the, the main uses of a, any robot is, is let's, let's put that at risk and, and keep a person out of harm's way. So we're seeing more and more uh, of that. We're working with, uh, with the sheriff's office here uh, on getting a team set up so they can perform some of that work as well. So what we like to do is be able to capture that data once we land, process that data, and then very rapidly give that to a decision maker to see if an area needs to be searched, to see if an area, how much damage it may have, or just to take it back to do just a rapid assessment. And that's the challenge that we ran into. The biggest challenge you ran into is taking too much information and giving that back to a stakeholder and that stakeholder not being able to assess it. And we've seen that in events that we've had in the past. Hurricane Harvey was a prime example. We, we got a lot of data but the, the decision makers and the stakeholders were actually trying to save people's lives outside of the area in which we were working. So we captured that data, we processed that data, and actually what they did there was took the data we had and pushed it to the public side. So the public information officer for that event put it into social media. And in the flights we were doing, the people could go online because we had connectivity and see if their homes were damaged or not they would be able to fly over certain neighborhoods. So we kind of went from processing the data to actually just taking the raw video, putting on YouTube, and then all the stakeholders or the people of the community were able to go in and look at it immediately. So in the Pix4D React, the, the, the nice thing about the Pix4D React is it's mobile. We can put it on a laptop, we can take it to the field, and we don't need connectivity to the cloud. Our assumption is when we walk into the field, no matter if it's today, as we call a blue sky event, where there's not a storm, we're able to walk out into that field knowing that we don't have to have connectivity to the cloud. Processing it locally also keeps the chain of custody. We're not sending it to a third party or sending it to the cloud, we're keeping it on our computer. So we can rapidly do that assessment, process the data, give it to the stakeholders where they can go and redirect the area. The sensor components of it, we look at it from different ways. In a search and rescue event, we may just do uh, photogrammetry. Whereas in a live uh, going and looking at damage assessment, such as in Mexico Beach, you're looking at it from a live perspective. We don't have time to process the data and capture all the images. If we can take a UAS, fly it down a road and look at the road, is a road viable to drive down? Do we see people potentially on the ground that's looking for help or assistance? we can do that in a live environment. Whereas once we know that people are safe and they've come out of harm's way, we can then come back in and actually map it and then take that imagery and process it in a controlled environment if it's there locally, if we need to rapidly assess that or take it back to a remote locations and process it locally there. 
So our team here at FSU, as well as uh, our partners in Crazar, uh, responded as part of the state and local response uh, to Mexico Beach after Hurricane Michael. Um, our original mission uh, was to Walton County, which is one county uh, west of where the impact was. Uh, we did their damage assessment or helped them do their damage assessment uh, on the day the storm came ashore. Uh, and then that evening we were retasked uh, to Bay County, uh, which is where um, Mexico Beach, Panama City, Panama City Beach are. Um, we were retasked there and on the morning of the 11th of October, uh, we were one of the first teams uh, from the county then uh, on the ground in Mexico Beach and with the mission to do the initial reconnaissance uh, of how bad, uh, how bad the damage was. And it was, a, it was a little unique in the fact that um, I think most of the world had a good idea of how bad the damage was on Mexico Beach. The media helicopters had, had come through and there was a lot of imagery. Um, however, the, the actual county emergency operations center in Bay County uh, was cut off. Uh, there was no communications in the county, there was no cell phones, there was no internet, there was no phone lines. Um, and so the decision makers in the county had not seen how bad everything was on the beach yet. And so that was their, their initial tasking, was to take the drone. And, and uh, actually our, our primary aircraft for that was the, was the Parrot Disco. Um, and to go out and do that initial reconnaissance and then bring that data back to them. Uh, and that was actually the first imagery uh, that the county emergency managers and the county administrators and decision makers had seen of, of Mexico Beach was, was via drone. Uh, looking at Mexico Beach and the events I've done since pretty much Hurricane Katrina, Mexico Beach had the most devastation I'd seen. Uh, going from Hurricane Harvey in Houston uh, was not a hurricane, it was more of a flooding event. You go down towards Corpus Christi, you go into Rockport, and those areas had heavy damage. But Houston had a flood, sustained rains over five days, 50 plus inches of rain. You go into Mexico Beach, there's just nothing there. You look at, it's like a tsunami just went, started at the beach line and pressed all the way into the city. Houses were in the middle of the street, uh, houses were laying in the ground, houses were gone. It was something that really I hadn't seen in a significant hurricane uh, in years. The reason why we've started doing uh, joint classes with, the, uh, with Chrysler and Florida State University is we want to take our experience, of real world experiences, and take that out to the community. Um, flying a drone in a, in a controlled environment is totally different than coming to a disaster such as um, Mexico Beach or going into Puerto Rico. We want to take that knowledge that we have and always give that information back to the community so they can understand and learn from the lessons that we've had, the good, the bad, the indifferent, and, and be able to take that in their day-to-day -day applications. The Anafi Thermal uh, really would support us in an all-hazards approach. When we look at all-hazards, we look at it from a fire perspective. How would it assist us in overwatching a fire? We can look at it from a visual sensor. We can look at it from the thermal sensor. We can look at it from a blended thermal uh, and visual sensor to be able to look at where the heat spot may be in that fire. From a search and rescue, it gives us the capability of being able to fly out, do a mapping mission, or do a mission where we have thermal and a visual sensor be able to get, you know, at the end of the day, we want to get out to the victim to be able to save, save their life and, and reduce risk. Uh, the hazmat side, it gives us the capability to zoom into a placard that may be on the side of a vessel or on the side of a truck. It gives us, again, that thermal component. Do we see gases leaking out of that potential uh, pressure vessel that could be the tanker that flipped over or could be a rail card? Uh, you look at it from the law enforcement perspective. It now gives you where you're searching for a suspect. We can now look again through the thermal capabilities and the, and the on-screen capabilities that you can actually look, uh, look at temperatures and be able to get that information back to decision makers and then reduce risk. And the ultimate goal of using any type of UAS platform is to be able to reduce risk and reduce the human factor. Uh, not putting people, a human, into the equation where they could get injured or killed uh, anytime you do that with a, a UAS platform or any unmanned platform. But I think the Anafi Thermal is a very viable solution at a very, uh, for assisting uh, us as first responders in getting our job done, because we all want to go home at the end of the day. So some of the advantages that the Anafi Thermal in particular has over other platforms, um, first and foremost, it's, uh, it's not 
geofence. There's no, there's, we can fly that wherever we need to without having to deal with uh, unlocks or permissions or certificates or having online access or anything else. That's a huge, uh, that's a huge benefit for us. Uh, and then at the same time, um, there's not a lot of concern about its data concert, data security, right? The, 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 the data in the Anafi stays uh, with us locally, and that's, uh, and that's a fantastic, uh, fantastic advantage that we have. It's not going to China uh, or any other uh, location. Um, uh, and it's not produced by China either, so that's, uh, that's good. Uh, from, a, from a usability standpoint, there's huge advantages there as well. The, the radiometric sensor, uh, the ability to easily share images from uh, the FreeFright application into FLIR tools uh, and do that post-processing kind of on the fly, on the tablet, uh, change palettes, all that right there is, is a huge benefit for us. Very rarely do we particularly in a search for a person, be it a, a willing target, uh, like a search and rescue or a search for uh, a law enforcement standpoint, very rarely uh, is a live find what we're looking for. In other words, we're not necessarily always gonna find them when we're flying the mission originally. Uh, we always have small screens and there's sunlight and there's all kinds of issues there, but we're always capturing that data, be it still imagery or video. Uh, and then when we land, we're reviewing that, right? What do we miss? when we flew it the first time. And the ability to, right there in the Free Flight app, kind of um, change the palettes and change the mode of the thermal camera to an absolute mode and say, show me what's hotter than 30 degrees centigrade and, and all that is a huge advantage for us. And um, um, it provides a lot of flexibility and a lot of capability that we don't get anywhere else.